And it's my belief, backed up by some interesting research, that there is a relationship between sexual repression from an early age and rather strong attitudes of aggression in later life, aggression and violence. And uh, one of the earliest people to write about this was uh, Wilhelm Reich, I think, who got it all wrong, but never interestingly wrong, if you like, because he was one of the students of Sigmund Freud. It is important to my whole philosophy, the way Reich thought, okay, as well as Kinsey, uh, because he uh, was concerned with an idea of explaining how it was that the German people at the time of the Third Reich could come to do such terrible things and to follow Hitler, murder all the Jews, behave absolutely disgracefully, start war and so forth, and have a very, very aggressive, hard-hearted attitude. And Reich, along with many other people, was exploring the idea that it was a kind of mass psychosis, the mass psychosis of fascism. And he attributed this to early upbringing and that the whole of society was going in the wrong direction in terms of its upbringing of children. Now, Reich may or may not have been right, and there are reasons to suppose that he wasn't in terms of uh, Freudian theory. Let's, let's knock that on the head. But there's a core aspect of his thinking there, which I think still applies in, say, American society, we can see very clearly, uh, where they're concerned with their, uh, more concerned with keeping their, their guns uh, and freedom to shoot. And they've got a very kick-ass attitude, uh, both in America and all around the world. And we saw that terrible incident recently where kids were mown down by a gunman. Forgotten how many children were killed at school by some mad gunman. And we have incident after incident of this. Now, what I would see this tied to as a sexually repressive childhood, which pertains more in the United States than in this country. Now, if there is a difference in approach to pedophilia in America as opposed to the United Kingdom, I'd say it's worse there more repressive, more hateful, more concerned to send people to jail for decades and hundreds and hundreds of years notionally. And I do think it is tied to uh, this early sexual repression. And there is some evidence to back this up. The word originally from its modern origins was derived from, from ancient words, but uh, paedophilia meant love for children. And in its psychological use, it meant love taken in the sexual sense as well as in any other sense. And this was a 19th century word. And it was one of many conceptions like homosexuality, which came out of the psychiatry of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And the gay movement, with reference to to homosexuality, they turned, well, they used the word gay because they preferred it and can understand that. Uh, It's much more user-friendly word than homosexuality, and maybe we should have come up with an alternative to paedophilia. The gay movement saw it as an opportunity, the existence of the concept of homosexuality and the homosexual, to have homosexual pride. In other words, turn a category of what was originally perceived in the 19th century to be an illness, to turn it into an identity, and an identity of pride, hence gay pride or homosexual pride, And we wanted to do the same thing with pedophilia. It's what Foucault called the reverse discourse. The discourse starts out being of a psychiatric nature, and then the people who are labelled unite and make it an identity. We weren't, as was sometimes wrongly said of us in the media, this shadowy organisation and so forth. We weren't shadowy. We were trying to sort of march into into the daylight of publicity. Uh, because we wanted to tell people about ourselves. We didn't want to hide anywhere in the shadows. And so uh, that's why we started putting out press releases and we produced publications. We uh, sent a questions and answers booklet, sort of what is paedophilia and, you know, sort of uh, what paedophiles think and feel and so forth. And it was questions and answers, about a 16-page booklet. We undertook the expense, and it was considerable expense then, of posting it. You couldn't email things or whatever. Posting it to every member of parliament, which was possibly too much of a red rag to a bull. But, you know, that was putting our message out there. And we also had formal law reform proposals. This was to be a proper organisation. You know, we had an AGM, we had a constitution. Everything was properly democratic and constituted. We felt ourselves to be part of the democratic process. And part of that was producing proposals for the reform of the law. 
and uh, we had quite an elaborate uh, document. I was, I can't claim any credit for drawing it up because I was not actually amongst the first members of PI, but there were those who were who uh, undertook this considerable task and, and did it very well. Actually, our legal proposals were seen, we are told, by the greatest reforming Home Secretary, arguably, that this country has ever known, Roy Jenkins who was responsible for presiding over the, uh, the reforms such as the abolition of hanging, the decriminalisation of adult homosexuality, reform of the abortion laws, reform of theatre censorship. Roy Jenkins was the bee's knees, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of a Liberal uh, Home Secretary. Now, he saw our proposals. We had a little mole in the civil service, who in the Home Office, who knew his thinking. And he saw that our proposals and said, well, yes, these are very good. Having a cat in hell's chance, of course, politically, but yes, good proposals. When Tony Blair introduced the ASBO system against antisocial behaviour, what he was doing uh, was entirely new as a means of trying to eliminate not just what was then considered to be criminal behaviour, but antisocial behaviour which didn't rise to the level of criminality, such as you know, noisy neighbours you know, making a nuisance of themselves and that, that kind of thing. So our proposals were on the same theoretical lines as ASBO's, but coming from a, a more liberal and permissive direction. What I mean by that is that both ASBO's and our proposals invoked the civil law as opposed to the criminal law. We saw it as using a more delicate instrument instead of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Because what you have when you have a prosecution of um, an adult for invol sexual involvement with a child is not only the adult going to prison for many years, as, as may well be the case, but you also have a traumatised child. Because if that had been a consensual relationship, and I contend that there are such things, then uh, what you have is a child who sees that relationship not only broken up, but also is made to feel responsible for his friend going to jail. Well, that's the way it used to be, and I think it's probably worse now. And seen as complicit in something bad, and that's what we wanted to get away from. The sort of headline position is that we're going to abolish the age of consent. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we felt that it was okay to have for any adult to impose himself or herself on a child, you know, in infancy or toddlers and, and young kids or adolescents or on anybody. That doesn't mean we would leave kids unprotected. There are more ways than one of having protection of kids who don't want to be engaged in relationships with adults. And this is where we had a more subtle system in mind than the, the sledgehammer to crack a nut of the criminal law. If instead you have a relationship examined, if somebody comes to light, a teacher says, or a parent thinks that something is happening which is not good for their kid, they can't do anything about it. It may be a, a teenager who's got very strong opinions, say a 14-year-old, something like that, who doesn't agree with their parents. But it could come before a civil court. We envisaged it as something like a family court, and those things exist whereby it would be talked through in front of a magistrate and the child would have a chance to put their view and so would the, the adult who's engaged with them and so would any other relevantly interested party. And then you would have a magistrate who's able to come to a conclusion which might be, well, this must be stopped. But if it was a case where the adult had clearly imposed themselves, then the criminal law could still be invoked, not on the basis of an age of consent, but on the basis of a sexual assault, full stop. We had a constitution... One of the main elements of that constitution was that we would have law reform which would involve the abolition of the age of consent and the replacement of the age of consent concept with an alternative means of protecting children against assault. So if a child was assaulted by an adult, if they're engaged in something they did not want, we would maintain the criminal law. We would not leave children unprotected what we would do would be to say that that person has offended by assaulting the child and it would simply be a matter of sexual assault or rape or whatever and the adult could still go to jail and the child would still be protected. Alternatively, if the child wished to say that it hadn't been imposed upon them, they would have the chance to do that and it would be you'd go to something like a family court in a civil court arrangement and it could be talked through in that forum in a civilised way without the, the heaviness or the trauma to the child, which would inevitably come through the criminal court proceedings. There's been a lot of confusion over what our proposals were. I think they were pretty good proposals, except for one thing, that they were very detailed, legalistic, 
and it would take a lawyer to understand them, unfortunately. This was a great problem. And it included one thing that the tabloids latched onto, and they tried to suggest that we'd got an age of consent of four and that uh, it would be okay to have sex with kids down to the age of four. That was never our intention. Part of the rationale of the proposals was that we considered and uh, made statements about the ages that children, uh, or stages that children go through. And they included a pre-verbal age. And what we were saying about children under four is that they should be assumed to be pre-verbal and not in a situation in which they could give verbal consent. And that's the only way in which four came into it, was as that developmental stage concept, where they were presumed to be at least verbally able to give some sort of assent or consent after that period. By the way, traditional English law has never recognised an age of consent when it comes to giving verbal consent outside of a sexual situation and even inside of a sexual situation. In our proposals, or at least in my personal approach, I felt that uh, sexual intercourse with a child under the age of 12 is always inappropriate and there should be some kind of baseline uh, law along those lines. First of all, let's say something about what we mean by sexual because I don't mean, when I use that word, penis in a vagina or or, or an anus. I am talking much more broadly than that. I think it's sexual and a sexual relationship if there's touching, intimate manner, almost wherever in the body, but the genital area certainly, but not only the genital area. And one interesting thing to come out of feminist literature is that when women are talking to themselves, if you like, amongst themselves in obscure feminist intellectual magazines, they will talk about the eroticism of motherhood. And they will talk about some women, not all, but some women experiencing orgasm during breastfeeding. And some women, all women, all mothers pretty well, are very, very intimate with their babies. And this is, or has, an erotic element to it. And so I don't think at any age that eroticism should necessarily uh, be ruled out. It can't be. A mother cannot be a good mother without being to some extent erotic. And this is where we come into the theme of pedophilia or attraction to children being a good thing, a beneficial thing, when it is attached to overall benevolent and good feelings to the child, as is usually the case 99% of the times between a mother and child. And that kind of eroticism is a good kind of eroticism. But it's not only felt by mothers, it's felt by others, including me. And so I don't think it makes sense to rule out erotic contact at any age at all. It just depends, however, on the nature of that contact and what the child feels about it and whether it's going to be a part of a relationship which is on the whole a good and loving and tender relationship. This links into what I was saying earlier on to some extent because, you know, you've got to think in terms of, or I would invite you to think, in terms of the integrated nature of the philosophy of sexual liberality as well as liberation. It's not just a matter of enabling people to have a good time. It's not about just being hedonistic. You know, the 1960s got a bit of a bad reputation for going too far in terms of um, selfish sexuality, men being able to put it about everywhere and women sort of having to carry the can when things went wrong with you know, pregnancies and this kind of thing. I was never in favour of unbridled hedonism. To me, it's always part of something a a little bit more deep. Having said that, it's not necessarily a matter of exclusivity. I think we have a lot of problem attached to jealous sex and exclusive sex. So it's not about lifelong relationships necessarily, but it is about good feelings towards whomever you are with at that time. That means caring about them.